Welcome, my friends, to the Bob and Brad podcast, produced by Bob and Brad, the two most famous physical therapists on the internet. I am Bob, who is, and I'm exactly one half of the Bob and Brad team. Today, I'm going to be joined by our guest, Dr. Anuja Matthew. She's a physical therapist uh, with a doctorate in physical therapy and a master's degree in physical therapy. She also is certified in orthopedics with an orthopedic clinical specialist certification and that's earned by the by only 5% of the physical therapists across the country. Uh, she's also trained in women's health and pelvic floor. Uh, she's been in practice for 10 years. Um, she's kind of an expert on uh, women's health conditions such as urinary incontinence, pelvic pain, pubic symphysis dysfunction, diastasis recti, prenatal and postnatal rehabilitation. So we'll get into a lot of those subjects today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Anusha Matthew. All right, well, now we're gonna to switch to our final topic here. We do wanna talk about urinary incontinence um, mm -hmm. during and after pregnancy. Um, mm -hmm. um, what do you, what kind of incidents do you see of that uh, or prevalence? Um, um, a lot actually, um, and post honestly, postpartum a lot more. Um, during pregnancy, most women are told it's normal, you can feel it. Um, honestly, it's more common than it is normal. Um, sure. If you have good pelvic floor strength, then you shouldn't be leaking anything. Um, even during if pregnancy. you are, even during pregnancy, yes, a lot of tissues are stretching out, it's pushing out. So you might have the increased urge, you might want to go to the bathroom more often. But if you are leaking out a lot of urine, then you need to work on your strengthening because this will get worse um, postpartum. Um, so that, that's the reason why I see more postpartum uh, stress incontinence um, more than prenatal or during pregnancy. Um, Exactly. But it's, it starts like the education or the strengthening, it all starts during pregnancy in order to prevent it or reduce the chances. Got you. Um, so Kegels, you want to tell what Kegels are? Uh, that's the thing about Kegels. I mean, everyone wants to go to do Kegels, but um, it depends, all depends on the assessment, um, especially postpartum. You could have so much scar tissue, so much... Um, hypertonicity in your muscles that the weakness is just coming from the muscles being tight and not just weak because they're loose. Sure. Um, so it is important to address what is actually causing the incontinence. Yes, most of the times it is the walls, the, the pelvic floor that's weak that will cause the incontinence, but sometimes it's also the tightness of the pelvic floor. Um, so yes, Kegels is a great way <laughs> to address it, but not always the only way. Um, That's to very go. important to know. Um, it, how do you assess tightness? Is that manually or? So, so it's not something you can do by yourself. Right. Uh, so usually pelvic floor um, physical therapy, almost like an OBGYN exam, only we sure. use our finger we're not using any tools. So when we assess with our fingers, just to check for, it's like any other skeletal muscle. It will have trigger points. It's gonna gotcha. have myofascial tightness. It will be weak or, you know, in a, it could be in a tightened position. So usually when you check with your finger, you can tell whether it's tight or if it's held up in a tightened position or if it's in a normal relaxed position. Um, the other thing that we check then with the finger is, uh, you know, the basic cue is if you can tighten around my finger, that would tell us the strength of the pelvic floor muscle that we're looking at. Sure. Um, what do you do for the tight muscles? Is, it, is that the breathing and the... Um, uh, yes. So breathing is one of the things that the patients can do it by themselves. Um, for tight muscles, usually like we do for any tight muscles or for trigger points, it's trigger point release um, or myofascial release, sustained stretching. Um, something you can do at home if you're comfortable, if you can reach with your finger is if this is your introitus or the opening of your vagina, then you can just with your finger, you're not going too deep, just maybe like half an inch. You're just doing, putting a sustained pressure at maybe a seven o'clock position 
or a five o'clock position or a 11 o'clock position, a one o'clock position, just to kind of stretch it out. Um, and you're holding that stretch for anywhere between 30 seconds to a minute um, or a minute and a half. And what you're really trying to do is what you would do with any other muscle, you're trying to stretch it out. Um, and you can do the same, uh, there are different tools that you get these days. You could get use a pelvic wand. It's like a, a different shape wand. It, it is better to hold it so you don't have to you know, reach. It's easier right. to reach with that. If you're comfortable using that, you can use that. Um, and for some patients, we even uh, if they're really, really tight or if they also have pelvic pain, pain along with incontinence, you could start using a dilator, which comes in different sizes to maintain that sustained stretch. In, in your practice, can you give a, a general percentage of what, how many people are tight versus how many people are, I have stretched out or not don't have the support? Um, I can't tell you. So most people who come in with pelvic pain are usually the ones with tightness. Um, most people who come in with incontinence will have um, some kind of prolapse or some kind of weakness. And occasionally, because they have um, tightness in their hip muscles or their core muscles, their pelvic floor is just held in tension because that's the only thing holding everything else then. Oh, sure. Um, so I've seen that in a lot of people, a lot of weakness around outside, like on the hip and the core, and that's causing more tension and incontinence because of that. Um, percentage wise, I would say, um, maybe less of the tightness. I can, I can give you a number right now, but, but so less it's people, fairly common though. Yes, it is fairly common and not just, um, for postpartum women, well, any women, in fact, a lot of athletes, um, have incontinence. Yes. Um, a lot of younger people, um, and as you start getting into your menopausal age, you, you start getting more incontinence issues as well. When someone's looking for a, a, a therapist to help them, what would they, who would they look for? What, what, what's the title they're looking for? And uh, So when they say, when you just say that prenatal posting, it's a very wide term. So they could be just doing exercises uh, with you, not really a pelvic floor evaluation and treatment. Right. So you want to look for pelvic floor therapist or someone who uh, treats pelvic health. Um, you want to make sure that they are doing the internal evaluation, examination, and treatment um, just to, to address your incontinence part of it. Um, if you're just going there for diastasis, you can go to anyone who has sure. done a prenatal, postnatal specialization. But for someone with incontinence or pelvic floor pain, um, you should definitely look for someone who has been doing pelvic floor treatment, not just um, prenatal, postnatal. Gotcha. Now, um, are there modalities that you use for this or is that typically no? Um, typically, no. Um, there are modalities you can use, especially for pelvic floor pain. Uh, they say you can use ultrasound. I honestly have never used it. Sure. Um, you can also use biofeedback, uh, EMG, and um, those things for if you have weakness or even tightness, it helps with the biofeedback just to see. Some people like seeing it. Some people like seeing that graph right. or that um, right. It moving or you know the flower blooming. There are different softwares that you get. Um, some people like that kind of feedback. So uh, if you're using those kind of machines, then it's a, it's a good feedback for them to know. Yes, they're contracting. Yes, they're relaxing now. Um, well, I remember a million thing. years ago, <laughs> they used to use diathermy. Um, I don't yeah. know, long time now, but <laughs> it's at the Mayo Clinic, so. Uh. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, well, I lost you there for a minute. Yeah, yeah, sorry. That was me. I was getting a call. So that's, yeah, I, I shocked you out. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. So, so um, with the, um, if, with people who have weakness, do you have um, cues that seem to work for them? Like, uh, you know, like what, what to feel when you're doing it correctly? Right. Uh, like a key um, yeah, so ideally, I like them to place their hand on uh, their pubis or their vagina just to feel those muscles. 
um, awareness is a big part of it. Um, so if you're feeling it, if you feel it move, you know that it's working. Um, the other thing I think um, most people respond to if we say like tighten your anus or um, if you're trying to uh, avoid gas from coming out. Um, that has worked because people have a better awareness of their anus than of the vagina. Um, it's, it, it's good to start with those cues. Um, the other cues they really respond to is the elevator um, uh, technique that they say. So imagine, your, <laughs> imagine your pelvic floor is an elevator. You're in that elevator. It's at level one. So when you tighten it, it's supposed to go to level two, three. So you're not just squeezing it, you're pulling it up. Sure. And once you reach that level three, it has to come back to level one again. So you feel it going down to level one again. Um, it helps patients with tightness who are, especially if they are tight, we just give them cueing to contract the pelvic floor so they can reflexively relax it. Um, so the elevator method, um, some patients respond to it, but most patients will respond to tightening their anus. Now, I had read that um, um, it's really not good to, like, you can picture, like, stopping the flow of urine, but it's not something you want people to do. Yeah, it's not. Also, it's very misunderstood. It's just a way of telling them that's what you're doing. But I've seen people right. end up actually holding their urine stream regularly, right. which is not something you're supposed to do. Uh, yeah. You're confusing the bladder. Uh, when you are uh, urinating, your, your pelvic floor is supposed to relax. Only then your bladder will contract. So if you contract while you're uh, letting the urine flow, you're confusing the bladder. You're actually causing a wrong behavioral pattern. Almost. Sure. Yeah, um, you're the, the pattern. Yeah. Um, uh, the other thing to remember when you're doing Kegels, it's... it's um, it's, it's like a secret, you know, you shouldn't, no one should be able to tell that you're doing it. So it's not like you're tightening your buttocks or you're squeezing your belly in and you're straining, you're making faces when you're doing it. You're, that means you're using all the wrong muscles. Um, when you're trying to do Kegels, you're just straightening your pelvic floor. That's the only muscle that should contract. Um, yes, you will feel some activation in your transversus abdominis, but you're not really trying to suck in your belly with that. Um, so I find, make I find sure. That because I've seen people who have taken that approach and I've seen some yeah. people seem like they want the accessory muscles to help you. So Yes, um, yeah. and that is that uh, traditionally that has been a technique where if you are not able to activate the pelvic floor, you know, bring in the adductors or bring in the glute. And, right. But I've seen that most patients then end up just using those muscles and still have no awareness gotcha. of their pelvic floor. Um, so in fact, a lot of my sessions I spend time just making them aware of where their pelvic floor is, what needs to be done in a contraction, what they need to feel. Um, so in fact, the first few sessions is just bringing that awareness uh, for them. Because um, so many people are just using accessory muscles to do it. I don't know if this is practical or not, but I saw that it also the suggestion to take like a piece of toilet paper by your anus and see if you can. Uh, <laughs> you it could. Uh, it could help. Um, but most of these people have so much weakness, it would be more frustrating if they're not able to do it. Sure. Um, also, the positioning of it, like if you, we usually have them start in lying down position with your legs relaxed. That way, all if you do have a prolapse that's causing the incontinence, all the organs are settled back. It's not pushing oh, into your sure. vaginal wall. So ideally, the right um, position to start with may be lying on your back or in a prone position on your, on your stomach, where all your organs are back into your abdominal canal. And when you tighten it, then your, your um, pelvic floor muscles have a chance to contract fully. Um, and then progress to different positions where you're sitting, then integrate it with exercises and standing and so on and so forth. I've heard of the feedback to where they actually have you put your hand over the perineum, the area between. Yes, the, yes. That goes. Um, that's how you usually start because when you are contracting your pelvic floor muscle, you will feel it go away from your perineum. Um, uh, the other thing that, 
Uh, yeah, the, the other thing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, the other thing I like to do is a lot of patients have the birthing ball. Um, I, I, if you have them sit on the birthing ball, it's actually pushing up on their perineum. It's kind mm -hmm. of giving you a feedback of pushing. So when you tighten your pelvic floor sitting on the, the birthing ball, you could feel it go up. And then when you relax it, you feel it come down uh, on that ball. That's also a good uh, feedback method. The, uh, the, the perineum is between the vaginal opening and the anus, just so people know. Anus. But is that be the uh, that birthing ball? Would that be? I've seen um, like OPTP. They sell like a pelvic prop that you sit on. Is yeah. That, yes, it's similar to a birthing ball. Yes, sure. it's a pelvic floor. It's it's a it's kind of perfume. It it's more yeah. rounder, so you can put it anywhere and sit on it. Um, but mo I've seen most patients um, they postnatally will have a birthing ball or they get a ball. And they're like, what do I do with it postpartum? So uh, it's I don't know what a birthing ball is. That just shows you my ignorance. What, what is this? Uh, it's, like? a, it's basically a thera ball or a physio oh, ball that sure. we use gotcha. in, the, in the clinic. Um, that's all that that's is. All is. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you just have them sit on that ball and have them do a kegel. It's, it's a good feedback as well. Uh, you know, it's interesting. To, I. I was showing my wife how to do Kegels and I, I started doing them myself and it helped my, <laughs> I was having some trouble with hemorrhoids and it helped my hemorrhoids. Oh, you know, it definitely. Just, will. Yeah. It provided support um, there. And, I mean, I'm a big fan. Also, also relaxation. Um, I see also some patients with constipation um, that actually oh, yeah, respond exactly. well uh, to pelvic floor physical therapy they do much better uh with constipation as well yeah i just i like you said you can do them anytime and you can i i do yeah. them a lot of times i'm just doing stretching prior to a run i'll, I'll even do them yeah so. yeah you can do it anytime anywhere no one can tell sure yeah exactly <laughs> so um uh we talked about is it kegels would you expect it to be the length of time again for to before you get some results. Um, um, ideally eight to twelve weeks for any kind of muscle strengthening that's there. But I have seen results even sooner because um, some people it's just uh, you know there's uh, not enough coordination or awareness of where the muscle is or how to contract it. Um, some patients will respond even in three to four weeks, and some patients it might take eight to twelve weeks. Um, that's what I see. But to, I don't know if it was as much weakness as it was just knowing how to activate those muscles. But yes, so. yes. Yeah. Um, so I, I would that. still give it eight to 12 weeks. Uh, don't sure. go crazy on trying to get results really fast. Uh, give yourself time and it will happen. Sure. Well, uh, Anusha, do, I, I don't even know if you want to mention this or not. Do, do you want to say where you practice and, and how would some? Um, yeah, do? sure. So um, our clinic is in downtown New York. Um, it's very close to the Staten Island Ferry. It's in the financial district. Um, and we see mostly uh, women's health patients and also orthopedic patients. Um, and it's closer to uh, Tribeca, Chelsea, that area in downtown Manhattan. Awesome. Yeah. So it's Anusha Matthew. You look for her <laughs> and we'll fill up your client list there. So, <laughs> yes, awesome. uh, the official address I would say is One New York Plaza. Uh, very easy to remember. Wow, very nice. <laughs> so, how are things going with the uh, post pandemic there? Um, oh, it's been it's been hard um, with um, all the telehealth, and then because it's a financial district, it's been uh, slow because most of our patients were the people who came to work in the sure. offices. Uh, it's not a very uh, heavily residential area, so um, it's taken a hit. But we're we're doing good with telehealth as well. Are you wearing up? Uh are you having patients come in yet or, or not? Yeah, actually throughout the pandemic, um, uh, prenatal and postnatal patients were coming in. They, a lot of them uh, were comfortable coming in, in person um, sure. to uh, get therapy, then do the telehealth. Um, so yes, we already have patients coming in. Were you wearing the mask and the shield? 
Yes, <laughs> the mask, the shield, the works, the gloves, and uh, uh, yeah. Awful, isn't it? It was, <laughs> it was awful because it was so hard to talk and yeah, it was hard to up everything. Yeah, hard my glasses. <laughs> I know. Terrible. Luckily, I don't have glasses, but the shield, honestly, the shield right. also fall out. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. So um, well, hopefully we're on yeah. the tail end of the, all this. So yes. Anything else you want me to add right now, Anusha? Or um, I think the only thing we missed about is the binder, using a binder oh, postpartum yes. and That's abdominal right. binder. Thank you. Um, for I, bring that up. <laughs> I I thought about it and then I forgot. But I do suggest patients to wear a binder postpartum unless they've had a C section, then uh, do not wear it. Um, and but that's not the only thing that's a go-to postpartum, but it's a good support that you would need, especially if you have diastasis, lifting your baby, carrying your baby, it would be a good support to start with. Um, so I do recommend using the binder at least for six weeks postpartum. And then yes, of course, start with your core strengthening and pelvic core strengthening. you get that approved by your physician first? I mean, would you want to run a body? Um, usually or? most patients would also have a belly wrap or a belly support that they use. I also recommend that uh, during pregnancy. You could just take out the straps and use the same um, gotcha. belly support as a binder. You're, it's not some. It's not like a lumbar belt that uh, that, that you need a prescription for. It's something you can just buy online or you know go to a drugstore and get it. Excellent. Um, but most patients, I have them use uh, the belly support that they were using during pregnancy postpartum. Sure, sure makes sense. Yeah. So good, good advice, good, uh, good tips here. Yeah. I, really, you're obviously very knowledgeable in your area of, of expertise, and I see you had a lot of uh, extra schooling. Uh, <laughs> yes. So. <laughs> Very impressive. So you ever want to be on the show again? Just let me know. Uh, it's It's been a pleasure. It was great talking to you. Likewise. So thanks. Uh, we'll cut it off here. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much.